Welcome back to another Hardware News Recap at the end of what has been and will continue to be the busiest week of our careers here. Uh, we've been working on some AMD stuff lately. As everyone knows, AMD is also dropping the prices of Navi already. So Super has had its impact on AMD before Navi even came out. Ryzen 3000 series, of course, has been in the news a lot lately and will be launching on tomorrow when this video goes live. So that'll be Sunday, July 7th unless we upload earlier. Uh, there was a power outage in Japan that resulted in the loss of a lot of NAND, game consoles dodging some price hikes, which is a good thing, and uh, some reports on Samsung and Nvidia partnering up, along with other things, but mostly we're focusing on some preliminary Ryzen and Navi discussion. Before that, this video is brought to you by the EVGA GTX 1660 XC Black video card. EVGA's GTX 1660 XC Black uses a fat heat sink to allow the card to run at lower noise levels for longer, capable of sinking more heat before the fan kicks in, and also has day one game ready drivers for game launches. The 1660 XC Black is short and compact for installation to small form factor PC builds, but if you need one that isn't extra thick, it's also accompanied by a dual fan counterpart with a thinner heatsink for standard dual slot support. Learn more at the links in the description below. Quick GN reminder, the GN toolkits are on store.gamersnexus.net, so if you've wanted one, they're up there. We still have a couple of the numbered ones, by the way. We held a few uh, just because the way the shipping logistics worked, so you might be able to still get one if you pick one of the signed ones up. Uh, moving on to AMD price drops. So, Navi, the $450 5700 XT, the original price, that will now be $400, bringing it down more on par with the 2060 Super and $100 below the 2070 Super rather than $50 below it. The 5700 non-XT, AMD often calls the XL, is $350 now instead of $400, and then the anniversary edition, the XT50, is coming down to $450 instead of $500 for basically the binned version of the 5700 XT. So those are the new prices. They're $50 lower each, and uh, based on what we've seen online, uh, because we, we, can't, we can't comment on anything yet until reviews go live, but based on what you've probably seen on the internet, these price drops were more or less necessary at this point because Super did actually force AMD's hand. It would put AMD in a tough position. So it's interesting. It's, it's interesting specifically because if AMD had come out with these $50 lower prices, the situation would look different. It would look more like AMD forced Nvidia's hand into creating super and bringing down the relative performance versus the price, or the relative price versus the performance, I should say. Uh, but instead, because AMD announced its prices first, and NVIDIA came to market, and now AMD, before even launching its product, is dropping the prices, it makes it look like NVIDIA is the one bringing competition to the market and bringing down the prices. So it's an interesting play, uh, if only from a PR standpoint, where AMD has now put itself in a position where it looks like it's on the defensive, it's, it's backpedaling, it's almost like an admission of, oh, our product's not that good. Like it's, they, they looked at the super performance and then went, oh, oh, okay, yikes, okay. Well, guess we gotta drop the prices. So purely from a PR and a visual standpoint, uh, doesn't look great, but the fact that the prices came down at all are obviously good regardless of performance. So we'll be looking at that more, uh, one could assume on release day, but yeah. Anyway, moving on. Ryzen 3000 and Navi reviews are in progress for just about everyone in the industry at this point. You've probably seen teasers from some people. And uh, I will note that this has been probably the most difficult week in, in my professional career working at Gamers Nexus uh, and running it because basically, to give you an idea, AMD is launching something to the tune of I don't know, maybe eight CPU SKUs on Sunday. Plus, they've got APUs. Those are mixed in there, too. Uh, they've got the two GPUs, and then NVIDIA just had two GPUs the same week. And so the end result is that Patrick and I have been working shifts. So he'll do like eight to 10 hours, and I'll do the rest of the hours in the day. And that allows us to cover the whole day. So we have test benches running <laughs> literally 24-7 at this point. And he and I have been managing multiple of them. 
uh, across a 24-hour period every single day for about a week now. And um, he's been doing more hours. I've been sleeping at the office. So we're getting the reviews done. <laughs> There's a lot of them. And it's an insane. So to give you an idea of just how difficult this review cycle has been, NVIDIA's launch for us, we weren't really expecting before Navi. We were expecting it after Navi. And because of that, we ended up in a situation where we're probably publishing like a month's worth of silicon component reviews in a day, uh, maybe a day and a half, depending. Anyway, yeah, that's what we've been working on. But the Navi price drops are the big news item for the show. Uh, $50 off of each one is the summary. And it, it, it is an interesting optics position for AMD to be in. Japan power outages. So uh, six exabytes of NAND have been lost, WD and Toshiba suspending production as a result of these power outages. An unexpected power outage in the Yokaichi region of Japan has affected facilities operated jointly by Western Digital and Toshiba Memory. The power outage, lasting roughly 13 minutes, happened on June 15th and has forced Western Digital and Toshiba to partially suspend operations. Operations are expected to resume as normal by mid-July. According to Western Digital's assessment of the incident, at least six exabytes of NAND will be lost. The, quote, the company currently expects the incident will result in a reduction of Western Digital's flash wafer availability of approximately six exabytes, the majority of which is expected to be contained in the first quarter of fiscal year 2020. That was in a Western Digital press release. Toshiba didn't disclose how much of its own NAND was affected, but some estimates peg the number to around 9 exabytes. Revenue and profit loss aside, TrendForce points out how this will impact client confidence in the companies. Quote, a fallout that Toshiba and Western Digital can expect is some loss of confidence from their downstream clients. The reliability of their production lines is now under doubt as the base is not resuming normal operation as quickly as can be reasonably expected for a leading edge semiconductor plant. And that's on TrendForce's write-up. AMD filed a new patent on June 27th entitled, quote, Texture Processor-Based Ray Tracing Acceleration Method and System, end quote. The patent's abstract states, the system includes a shader, texture processor, and cache, which are interconnected. The texture processor includes a texture address unit, a texture cache processor, a filter pipeline unit, and a ray intersection engine. The shader sends a texture instruction, which contains ray data and a pointer to a bounded volume hierarchy, or BVH node, to the texture address unit. The texture cache processor uses an address provided by the texture address unit to fetch BVH node data from the cache. The ray intersection engine performs ray BVH node type intersection testing using the ray data and the BVH node data. The intersection testing results and indications for BVH traversal are returned to the shader via a texture data path or data return path. The shader reviews the intersection results and the indications to decide how to traverse the next BVH node. NVIDIA uses BVH traversal and ray intersection tests for its own ray tracing implementation, but also has some added denoising features and scheduling and a bit different hardware. NVIDIA's shaders launch a ray probe with RT cores fetching and decoding while performing ray, or tri ray and triangle intersection testing. AMD appears to be engineering a fixed function solution for ray intersections. The technology is detailed well in the patent application if you're curious to learn more, but that's about all we have right now. We've been talking about the tariffs, price increases with uh, especially U.S. imports lately because that does affect the wider industry and how you can expect a lot of computer products to go up in price if they haven't already. Some of the computer cases have already gone up about 18% in price as a result of the tariffs, which isn't even a one-to-one -one increase. They're taking a bit of a loss on margin on that. The new information, the updated news, is that the most recently proposed $300 billion tariff proposal, in addition to the existing tariffs, has been suspended for now. The existing tariffs remain unaffected. Those, those would include ones that uh, impact, for example, case pricing, power supply pricing, GP price, oh, video card pricing, I should say. Uh, all of that stuff, that's still in effect. It's just that there's the new proposal, the $300 billion extra tariff, has been suspended. Huawei was placed on a so-called entity list and saddled with a trade blacklisting that has seen most major U.S. tech suppliers being forced to retract their business with the company without access to U.S. IP and chip technology, as well as operating systems like Android. Huawei's business in the western part of the world is uncertain, to say the least. However, the Bureau of Industry and Security granted companies a special license to continue supplying Huawei, 
although it was intended to be temporary. Intel and Microsoft have also pledged to support Huawei devices with critical security updates for the foreseeable future, something we talked about last week. Just exactly how much the U.S. is relaxing sanctions against Huawei is unclear at this point. The U.S. stated any network equipment affecting national security wouldn't be sold, and anything 5G-related is almost certainly off the table. In holding off additional tariffs, game consoles are able to avoid a significant price hike. When the $300 billion tariff proposal was announced, the one that would affect electronics like consoles, console makers were very quick to issue a joint statement, all working together, not something you see ever, a warning of how they could affect consumers, the tariffs that is, and the industry alike. For now, it seems like the situation between the U.S. and uh, Chinese economies has at least stopped advancing with the tariffs. We'll see how it progresses, but the major news item that we care about here on this channel being technology related is that the uh, tariffs that were recently proposed that Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft joined together to oppose uh, have been suspended. So those concerns of the price hikes on consoles and other electronics, they're all affected, uh, those, those prices will not be going up for import right now, or at least for the foreseeable future. The next one is a report on Samsung and its manufacturing. The Korea Herald is reporting that NVIDIA will partner with Samsung for its 7 nanometer Ampere GPUs expected sometime in 2020. The report cites Korea leader Yoo Yun Jun as confirming the switch from TSMC. In a statement to Tom's Hardware, NVIDIA neither confirmed nor denied the veracity of the report. Quote, we do not comment on rumors or speculation. We already use both TSMC and Samsung and qualify each of them for every process node. We can't comment in any further detail on future plans, but both remain terrific partners. And uh, that phrasing is so familiar to us that I'm, uh, we could probably pinpoint the exact person at NVIDIA who wrote it. Uh, that's a very common response. We don't comment on rumors or speculation. So anyway, the report's interesting. The reports uh, last month that serviced on Samsung showed that Samsung was working to aggressively undercut TSMC with 7 nanometer process fabrication. So that's been a, a big news item as 7 nanometer has begun to take the, the forefront in new products. A PCIe 4, Gen 4, SSDs have been showing up one terabyte as well, starting at about $230. And these Ryzen 3000 and updated AM4 platform with the X570 chipset will support PCIe Generation 4. They'll be the first mainstream platform, basically a reference platform for PCIe Gen 4 at this point, which is uh, an interesting play, a good place for AMD to be with Gen 4. They're at the front of it. And with that comes the first consumer-oriented PCIe Gen 4 devices, including SSDs. Technically, there's also the Navi side of things where those are PCIe Gen 4 enabled. So there is actually something on the GPU side. You can't take a Titan RTX, for example, and expect it to have Gen 4 bandwidth by just plugging it into a Gen 4 slot. So it would kind of make sense because the CPU ultimately dictates Gen 4 support and then the motherboard after that. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the GPU also has to be compliant. So Navi is the first of the GPUs, and then the SSDs are the first uh, that actually matter. The GPUs, frankly, Navi is not going to be fast enough for Gen 4 to be relevant in any reasonable use case that our audience would be involved in. So gaming production doesn't matter for the most part. Uh, Navi is just not, it, it doesn't push enough data down the pipe for it to matter. But for PCIe 4 SSDs, that, it will matter. Gen 4 actually is significant. If you're doing something with those higher end SSDs, that is going to be uh, transaction intensive. So the news here is that there are two available for order. There's the Sabrent Rocket and the Corsair Force MP600. Gigabyte has an AORUS model coming, but it won't be available at Ryzen's launch. Of the two available, both use Toshiba's 96 layer TLC NAND and are based on Fizon's PS5016 E16 controller. Currently, the only PCIe 4 SSD controller on the market is Fizon's E16 controller. Both Sabrent and Corsair are offering capacities of either one or two terabytes, and both offer similar performance by the marketing tax, so we haven't tested them and probably won't, but hopefully someone will pick up Alan Malventano's uh, testing regimen. So sequential reads are marketed at five gigabytes per second, sequential writes four gigabytes per second. For one terabyte, prices start at $230 for the Sabrent Rocket. Corsair's MP600 will start at $250 for one terabyte.
Another patent filing for AMD in this one. This one's really interesting too. AMD filed for a patent that outlines a thermoelectric cooling solution for 3D stacked memory. This is becoming uh, more interesting as well because Intel has been talking about 3D stacking more of its products going forward. This was something that was more or less proven as doable with NAND, and now it's moving into uh, other parts of the silicon industry as well. The patent describes a solution for P-type and N-type semiconductors using a, uh, an integrated Peltier effect for cooling. And the drawings associated with the patent essentially illustrate inserting a Peltier device between the memory die and the logic layer of a chip. This patent makes sense as AMD has been looking into embedding memory onto processors for a while. And this is similar in some ways to what Intel is doing with its Favros technology, uh, something that we talked about in about December or so of last year. Silicon Lottery will offer binned Ryzen 7 3800X and 3900X Ryzen 9 chips uh, for the immediate future. AMD is continuing to gain some ground in the enthusiast segment with well-known binning and overclocking service providers Silicon Lottery offering binned Ryzen 3000 chips. Silicon Lottery has updated its website with placeholders for the R7-3700X, R7-3800X, and R9-3900X and the 3950X. And according to the website, availability for the binned chips is July 13th, roughly a week after Ryzen 3000's July 7th launch. A uh, quick side note here too, the 3950X will not be included among those that is releasing later in the year. I believe it was September for that one. Ryzen 3000 chips will be using a, a soldered heat spreader, soldered IHS this time. So uh, we're not sure if Silicon Lottery will be extending its DLID service to the chips. That is something that the company also provides. Technically, you can get a bit of uh, an uplift in performance if you DLID a soldered chip. Intel AMD doesn't matter and remove the indium, which is kind of a pain, but you can buy a solvent to do it. it look, it's basically a liquid metal. And then uh, you can apply liquid metal to it and improve the thermal performance. Not really worth it in our opinion generally. We haven't done this with Ryzen 3000, obviously, but for past processors, uh, on average, it's not super worth delitting once it's already soldered. That does take out a lot of the, the issues, but you could still improve performance. So we don't know if they'll offer that, but we do know that they're binning them. That's it for this one. Subscribe to catch a lot of reviews coming up. Make sure you check back with us frequently on Sunday, on July 7th, because we're posting a lot of videos that day, and they'll be a bit staggered, just so that the, each video has space to breathe. And we'll post up on the website as well, alongside those videos. But YouTube uh, is going to be where it's at for the deeper parts of our content and make sure you check back regularly on Sunday and on Monday of this week, so the 7th and the 8th for all of the coverage because I don't, we're not sure how much it will get pushed to your sub boxes if we're publishing that many things. That's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus dot, or well, slash gamersnexus directly or store.gamersnexus.net to pick up the GN toolkit. I'll see you all next time.